I'm Robert Rosca from the European Expo, and I'll be giving a talk just introducing a project called PANOSC and how it aims to help improve the state of reproducible science in some photon intro facilities in the EU. So for a bit of context, I'll explain how my facility works very quickly. So EU XFIL is a X-ray free electron laser where you just get some electrons accelerating down a line and then you've got these little undulating things that shake them around and you get X-rays spit out at the end. This is really useful for some special use cases because you have lots of pulses. So at EUX4, we have up to 27,000 X-ray pulses a second, and they're less than 100 seconds each. And this means it's one of the most brilliant X-ray sources in the world. So you have lots of photons, they're like really, really short pulses. And this lets you do fast imaging to the point where you can get like sub 100 femtosecond um, like frames for live imaging of some dynamics. The problem this introduces is the amount of data you get. So when you have 27,000 pulses a second, if you just have a one megapixel detector, then you end up with around 54 gigabytes a second of data and about 194 terabytes an hour peak data. And that's just for a single detector. You can even stack these, you can have multiple ones of these, or you can have up to like a 16 megapixel detector and then you get a ridiculous amount of data. This isn't just a problem at EU Expo. This is a problem in quite a few of these photon neutron facilities in Europe and throughout the world, I guess. So this is just a quick overview of some of the data produced. So currently, most hover around the 100-ish, 200 terabytes to a few petabytes range. And in around four years, Expo is predicted to have about 100 petabytes of data a year. This is quite a big problem because with these facilities, they're all publicly funded. So all EU taxpayer money goes to fund these places. So in principle, the data should be accessible by the public as well. So there has to be some mechanism for people outside of, outside of the facilities to actually analyze the data and look at it, which isn't very practical if, since nobody could really download these things. The we, it, it, it seems like we should have sound here. So does anybody else have a problem? I'll respond in the chat. That's right. Yeah. So this is where PANOSC comes in. It stands for Photon and Neutron Open Science Cloud. And it's a col collaboration of a couple of these facilities to try and work together and figure out a, a solution to this problem. And the approach we're taking is to try and fit all of this data analysis into the FAIR principles. So the data has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So you need to have a way for anybody really to be able to find this data by some metadata catalog, search through it, find what they want to analyze, and then run their analysis on there. And we need a way to also reproduce the analysis people have previously done. So ideally, you'll be able to have some publication, some paper somewhere, and look through the paper and you can see these are the plots they've made, these are the figures they've had, and you can reproduce whatever they did to end up with that data. So of course, Jupyter is a pretty natural solution to this, since you can combine your code with some explanations of what it's doing. There are some people who've already been taking this like very friendly approach where they have a notebook linked to a paper and then they explain through the notebook how they got that paper, uh, through the notebook how they got those results and those figures. And that would achieve the main goal of having a uh, reusable analysis. And yeah, the reusability thing is a huge problem in science right now because it's part of the scientific method that people have largely forgotten about and it's very hard to actually figure out how people get the results in their papers. So a lot of time is wasted by scientists just trying to repeat work that's already been done. So the vision of PANOSC is to have a unified web interface between these six large facilities where you can go on there and you can search up for some specific type of experiment or some specific sample. Then you can find whatever data you want and you can start up a Jupyter notebook and do whatever you need to do to analyze that data yourself. Or you can find Jupyter notebooks that are linked to that data already. And you can click through those and start the notebook up previously made, run through the analysis, 
and see what they've done and all of the results they get and reproduce everything straight away. In addition to this, there's some workflows that are very difficult to transfer into a so we also going to have a uh, remote desktop for those kind of like uh, 3D interfaces that might not work very well in a notebook. Yeah, so again, largely we're saying things I've said before, you need to find the data, access it, interact with it, re-execute it, and also modify and extend work people have previously done. Now with these facilities, you'll frequently have embargoes on data. So the users come in, they put a proposal through, they do their experiment, and for the next like one to three years, nobody apart from them should have access to that data. So there has to be some way for people to extend the permissions and allow us to read this data. And then at the end, this data also has to be available to the public once the embargo is over. And <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, this is just the things users can do. Yeah, and the challenges are quite big. It's, uh, it's quite a hard problem to solve. So we have six facilities each of which have different metadata. So it's very difficult to kind of unify their approach to how they store their data and how they categorize it. And each of them have completely different experiment types. So that makes it even more difficult to actually classify the data sets. For some data sets, the data cannot be moved at all. Like sometimes you'll get something like 10 terabytes, 20 terabytes for an experiment, which is big but acceptable. But for the longer running experiments, you can have like half a petabyte or a petabyte for a single a single run of an experiment, which is huge and can't be moved. So it'll have to be, you have to bring the analysis to the correct uh, computing center where the data is stored. And <clears throat> we haven't, like the, the project's a four year old project and it's only been running for a few months. So we're still kind of figuring out how to do this. We have a couple of options. So the clearest option really is to run containers per notebook or maybe per experiment or per run or per facility, that part isn't very clear yet. So we'll have to have a, a, some certain, like we, we have to figure out first on what level to actually split things into. Then we need to maintain these for future, for the future as well. Because something you install now, current packages now will run fine, but then in 10 years time, if you want to reproduce the results for an experiment, uh, you might not be able to find the correct versions or might have some version mismatch, and then you won't be able to actually see how something worked a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, we also have some other challenges, which are that people don't exclusively use the notebooks for their analysis. So somebody might have done some pre-processing to the data of some command line tools or some command line scripts, which we can't really keep track of. And then we also have the challenges of what to do with the actual, um, the actual products of a notebook. If we should save them at the end, if they should just be assumed to always be the same, and then if you just kind of leave it to the notebook to create the same result, <clears throat> then there's the problem of the amount of resources needed for these things. Sometimes it's a very basic analysis, like just summing some frames. Sometimes it's something much more complicated that takes hours of uh, HPC time and like a few dozen nodes. Yeah, the other challenges are mostly uh, like administration ones and trying to link things together. So Panosk is supposed to work with something called the EOS Hub, which is the European Open Science Cloud Hub. And that's, that development is happening concurrently. So it's quite hard to actually work together throughout the EU with like dozens of people and lots of institutes. Uh, again, the data policy is, is quite a hard thing to solve as well. And then we also have the problem of some scientists not particularly being used to the Jupyter notebooks themselves. So they prefer their, their console commands, they prefer running things outside of the notebooks, and if they do that, you can't really reproduce what they've done very reliably. Oh, I was very fast, but still. Yeah, so... This is pretty much it. The main problems we have are tracking and reproducing what has previously been done in a notebook. The main thing I've seen just from working with the scientists is that they tend to not run cells one after another. They'll run some cells, then maybe change them, not run them, move back up to a previous cell, change that, or like run them out of order, 
and then you can't just rely on having the notebook file, assuming that you can just run it cell by cell to reproduce what they've done. So that's one of the big problems that we need to solve. There are a couple of tools which already kind of tackle this, like CoCalc, which people have mentioned before, and that you can go through a little timeline and scroll forwards and backwards to see what's, what's been done in, uh, like at various times. There's also something called Code Ocean, which uh, basically solves this problem, but I'm pretty sure it's closed source and uh, paid for service. So that's not really an option for us. But yeah, so the main reason I'm here is just to see what other people have done in relation to these kind of problems. Now it's about 15 minutes too fast, but yeah. That's, that was lots of time. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Have you looked at Nodebook with a D? Nodebook? That's mm. something open source in the Jupyter system out of Stitch Fix that's trying to address this. So, uh, oh, so excellent. I have not used it. Has anyone here used it? They can comment on it. Yes, it's github.com slash stitchfix stitch fix slash nodebook. Nodebook. There was one at Jupyter okay. that was presented too that was really slick, but it, I think it kind of like you had to completely replace the Python kernel with it uh, to do it. But, but like it had some really neat ideas because it would show you like this cell is now no longer valid, like you would need to rerun it. Basically kept track of the provenance between cells. Okay. Instead of numbers, it used uh, hashes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, unique, that's not the same thing. I, I don't think it's the same thing. I remember that in Jupyter but I don't remember what it's called. You just had to use a custom kernel. Yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. It was really cool. cool. I don't know if it would be a drop in replacement. Yeah, it sounds good. So, in your ideal world, how would you address this out of order running issue? Because uh, having out of order running <laughs> lets people interactively play much more fluidly, but you're right that. At, at the state where you're publishing and sharing, it can get really confusing. So how would you address it? So the simplest way is to have a timeline. So you just keep track of the order of the cells were executed in and how they were changed, and you could rerun it that way. In my more ideal world, you have the interactive session where the scientists do what they need to get their results at the end. And then at the end, you, you save these results within the session, so you get your plots, your tables, your data, whatever you need to use. And there's a kind of check where it tries to run the notebook. And if what the notebook spits out doesn't match up to the results, it'll say, oh, your notebook isn't fully reproducible. Can you please look through it and make sure that you have to, like, you run the cells concurrently? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we, um, at LSS team, we are sort of struggling with a similar problem. I mean, we're, we're doing this in one context at this point. So we don't have any actual science yet. Build notebooks, but we think that we are going to build a CI framework on top of NV report to do something fairly similar. But um, effectively, once you've got the notebook doing the thing you want, then as part of the check in and promote it to you know, the public branch, NV report will step through in order and do some sort of you know, or some sort of cell by cell testing. And yeah. Only if it of course, deciding what counts as identical enough is a whole different can of worms, but yeah. yeah. So in, in, in the report, I think, has enough the skeleton that you can build a cool framework on top of. Cool. All right. Thanks. Data, data flow was the one that I was talking about. Wow, there's a lot of things. Yeah. There's a project, uh, it's under um, GitHub under the Microsoft org, so it's Microsoft slash Gap that we saw invented uh, just a few weeks ago here at my group. It's done by, uh, it was done as a summer research project with, by a Berkeley HCI CS student with Microsoft Research. And I think it's probably one of the most interesting and promising things I've seen in this regard because it tries to kind of go to the heart of what Jason was saying, which is kind of this dichotomy between you want the flexibility of exploring non-linearly and hopping around. When your brain is really in, when you're deeply in that context, then you, you do keep track of what you're doing and it's fine. Like you don't care too much about this stuff at work, you're just trying stuff out. It's kind of like you're yeah, in your workshop working with your tools, you know where you put the screwdriver, you know where you put the hammer. It's fine that it's a mess, you're getting stuff done. The problem is when you come back a week later, you have no idea where you left your stuff and it's the same thing here. <laughs> so, so what it does is it tries to effectively analyze 
the outputs and results, and you can say, these are the results I want. I want these plots, I want these cells. And then it goes and looks and lets you choose and says, I think it analyzes the code and says, I think these are the things you want to gather into an actual standalone document that will work. So it's basically an assistant that lets you treat individual notebooks more like scratch work, so, but makes it very, very easy with good UI to pull out the pieces that you may want to turn into a more persistent thing of document. And I actually think something like that is the right approach. Basically, let you work something that lets you be messy, but makes it very easy to say, okay, I'm almost done. And maybe I'm not fully done, but I've done enough that I want this to be in a state where I can pick it up in a few weeks when I get back to it. So here you go, let me help you. I think this is what you need. Double check, have a look, rerun it if need be, and then you'll save that as another document. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, I, and then the raw material is basically the splatter of cells. It's not a document, right? Um, I think it's a very interesting idea. I haven't actually used it, but this demo was very, very strong. Um, they, they worked out as a paper for Kai, which is the, the big HCI conference. Uh, I think it's worth a look. It's Microsoft on um, GitHub, Microsoft slash Gather. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So um, you talked about some cases where you have uh, you know, analysis that maybe can't feasibly done directly in the notebook. So maybe it has to be coupled with some other practices. Yeah. Yeah. Is that sort of your thought? Uh, it was mostly things that rely on very uh, I don't know, niche tools that are used, like there's six facilities. There's lots of these little tools that people have like thrown together with, with some, I know, PyQT or something, and it's just too much effort to move all of them into, into a notebook. Do you think having some kind of standardized, almost like lambda type function within the notebook interface where you can easily encapsulate you know, some analysis and there's a framework around that for how that might get executed on some back-end resource or something. So maybe it's containerized or something like that. But mm -hmm. the point is that you drive it through the notebook. Do you think that could Yeah, we, we kind of do things like that already. Uh, I don't, it's probably not on one of these slides. No, it isn't. But we have some notebook tools where you pretty much just use the notebook to run some Slurm jobs. Yeah. So you, you give it some task, basically, and then the notebook itself goes, looks at the cluster, sees how many nodes are available, and then allocates the nodes, and it gives you little progress bars, and it says, oh, this is when this is finished, blah, blah, blah. And, and it abstracts a lot of that from the user, so they don't have to think about Slurm. They just yeah. say, this is the right one to run. Yeah, they just go in there, and they just click, and they say, I want to run this calibration pipeline on this data set, and I want it to do, like, this kind of calibration, then this, then this, and this, and just a workflow. Yeah. And then it just does everything for them. And at the end, it just says, okay, it finished. Or yeah. it ran out of time and the nodes didn't last long enough. But yeah. No, that's cool. I might suggest that was a great you know, Frameworks around that. Cool. Any other questions or discussion? I have another question. There's still time. All right. Yeah, plenty um, of time. On a related project, which Bill may talk about um, during one of the lightning talks, there's a lot of commonality because it's a kind of a web interface for doing bioinformatics analysis. And one of the things we're trying to, we're trying to, it's meant to be fair, but there's kind of wanting to be fair and being fair and you know, all you know that. So a lot of the challenges that we're wrestling with is, is sort of around ontologies and how you deal with those. And I was curious, also we've been thinking about how do you track things like samples, which you may want to look through. Are, is that being addressed at all in some of the FAIR it, sort of data framework stuff that you're... Ideally it will be. Okay. Currently it really isn't. Okay. But yeah, that's one of the, the main problems because there's a lot of fragmentation with how the scientists store what they've done. Like most of their things, we have an e-log. So during the experiment, they have some notebook online and they can write notes in there and say this it was this sample we ran the experiment for this long we had these parameters storage yeah. some of the things are stored automatically in the data just by the way we acquire data at eux file some of the things are written on a post-it note and like left on a screen somewhere yeah. so it is yeah that's one of the other big challenges actually keeping track of all data that the scientists all the information that they know that you need to know to actually yeah, to give the context and to analyze things properly that isn't really stored anywhere yeah. that's easily accessible. Yeah. I'll catch you during the 
learn how to write. Thanks. Yeah, hopefully. Whether I'm prepared or not. Uh, it's, I didn't say that. it's interesting hearing what people say because I, I I realize we're at Greenfield and it's 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 been nice not have to deal with, you know, twenty years of legacy or thirty years of legacy where you have POSIX accounts and all that fun stuff. Uh, my name's Robert Rob Nagler. I work for Radiosoft. Um, we're a scientific consultancy specializing in beam physics and particle accelerator, accelerator applications. We're a software simulation house, basically. Um, I'm a programmer, Paul, programmer, and I want to do a personal note. It's his birthday today, and he turned 50, and he sent a pretty funny picture, which I won't embarrass him with. Um, <laughs> And David, Chris, and Nathan are the physicists. They do all the hard work. My job is making sure that they can get their job done. Uh, I think a lot of people here are that way, and I just try to take that on, and I've had to evolve in this space. I've only been doing it for about five years. I haven't really thought about it. I'd like to thank the Department of Energy for sponsoring our work, which has been really generous. Um, the slides and some references are available at rsl.link slash jcw19. I'll repeat that at the end of the talk. Um, I'll talk why we use Jupyter and Jupyter Hub. Um, it's uh, a little bit different from what's been talked about here. And uh, what we did to make it happen, it's been a big evolutionary process. And of course, I'll have my wishes. So, uh, somebody mentioned 3D visualization. Here's a 3D visualization. Um, SINRAD is a code out of CERN. It's uh, the classic, we're gonna run this thing and do a very specific thing. COMSOL is multi-physics. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Uh, by the way, I did, we had a project where we integrated COMSOL into Ogden via so It's kind of a crazy thing. Um, we don't aren't doing that anymore. Um, so the scientist has to compare the output of COMSOL and the output of SINRAD. And is that COMSOL can do more physics and SINRAD can do one thing really well and COMSOL needs to be programmed to do that thing. And so you know this is a heat load on a mirror and an accelerator. I don't understand any of this stuff. So if you hear words out of my mouth, they're just words. Uh, the, the thing that Jupiter gave this particular scientist something more than just having some new plot scripts is that he can edit this file. It's a living document. That's what I think gives people, I mean, it's the exact problem we're just talking about, but it's the thing that gives Jupiter, um, you know, the, the power for these scientists. I think that's, that's something that, you know, this trade-off between reproducibility and getting the science done is really hard. And um, I vote for getting the science done. Uh, so this is a guy who pushed us to use Jupiter a lot. Um, and, you know, we put it up for him. Uh, and he likes using Jupiter Lab as his IDE. He uses it on NERSC. He has uh, analysis running maybe one panel, he calls it and uh, running a job in another panel. Uh, this happens to be on our cluster where he's running an MPI job and doing an analysis of that data. Uh, finally, the classic model of uh, a Jupyter article. Uh, this was apparently instrumental. The, the, the physicist said this was unbelievably important to me. Being able to describe the algorithm helped me think through it in a way where I can mix code, test those code pieces, and then uh, describe what happened and why. 
and it says all interesting things which I don't know. I don't even know what a witness bunch charge is. So there you go. Um, our biggest use case is teaching. We're, we're a commercial company, but we like supporting. We're open to source software companies. So if you know Kitware, we're a mini Kitware. Let's just say that. Um, uh, we try to help scientists at universities, at labs, understand things. Uh, we use Jupyter Notebooks to deliver that almost, I think, exclusively. Sometimes there are scripts. Uh, in pretty much the last six, I think, US Particle Accelerator School sessions, we've hosted either with Jupyter Hub or we have a science gateway called Repo, and we support uh, the US Particle School to teach students how to use these codes, which are very complex, and they have arcane formats. That's a, a big point. Um, some of these codes are 40 years old. Uh, who knows what a, one of these nameless files in Fortran is? Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. Right. So uh, and that's probably the best described formats we have. Um, the uh, ICFA machine learning workshop in Switzerland was run on our Jupyter Hub cluster in Fort Collins, Colorado. I thought that was kind of fun. They, were, they didn't even care, they didn't even notice. It was great. Because Jupyter notebooks themselves are interactive, but they're not, right? They, don't, they can send their messages and get them back and you don't really care about latency that much. Um, and we're not uh, on internet too, we're on a one gigabit link. Uh, oh, even less than that. We, we have to pay for the bandwidth. Um, so there were 60 participants and they really enjoyed uh, using Jupyter, it, it, where we educate people on Jupyter, actually. A lot of people don't know about it. That's part of the process. So a little bit of a summary of, of the use case, why, why we use it. Um, it's, it's an IDE for simulations. It's really the IDE for all of our users, and I'll mention that again. Um, you can also help code in it, which is really important to us. You can run Emacs or VI. I just had to install Vim Enhanced in the release this morning because somebody loves VI, right, or whatever it is. Um, it's, in another a subtle point is, uh, and I don't mention my use case, which is we don't have SSH into any of our nodes. And that made me happy. They're all running inside of containers. I don't have to worry about it. You know, I know what user they're running as. It's a single POSIX user. Don't have any of that legacy stuff you guys have. Um, specifically with Radius Saw, uh, we bundle everything. I think we use containers wrong. Sorry, Michael. We, uh, we do use them wrong, and I'll show you why. Um, and, but it makes it easy for people to do technology transfer. They don't have to answer the question, what's running in our Jupyter server? I just, a notebook, a Python 2 notebook, can I get everything? Or a Python 3 notebook, can I get everything? Or I SSH, SSH, bring up a terminal window, and I can get access to all the codes on the command line. And for our environment, we provide enough cores. A lot of our codes don't necessarily scale to 10,000 cores. Some of them do. But uh, usually a few nodes solves a problem. So physically, we have 14 staff scientists who use Jupyter every day, I would say. Some virtual machines on their Macs, but most of them log into Jupyter. Um, uh, there are 46 public users. People just come in from all over. We don't know who they are. Some of them we do, actually. Kind of like try to figure it out, like who, who are they? Oh, Shanghai, Diamond, whatever. But we don't advertise it very much. We just mention it here and there, and people find out about it. And it's convenient for them because they have the codes, and sometimes they really do use, use the resources. About seven terabytes are used, not petabytes, but terabytes, but they're actually used, and I have to struggle with that because we're a company, we have to buy those disks, and it's expensive. Um, the Jupyter, uh, I'll talk about this, we have multiple pools in Jupyter, our Jupyter Hub configurations, so we can reconfigure our Jupyter environment based on what's needed, and we have four internal nodes where our staff users use it, and one public node where we allow everybody to come in and use that. Uh, there are 13 MPI nodes. What that means is people can just say MPI exec, more or less, and it runs a job. 
no slurm, no torque, none of that fun stuff. These guys build drivers and they like having direct access to one node, two nodes, whatever. And we abstract out the whole thing so they don't need to know host names and that type of thing. We run an NGINX reverse proxy. Um, you can set up the whole thing with our CI, um, CM, CMT, it's not a CMS, configuration management tool so that uh, we can run a full Jupyter operation on our desktop quickly so that we can get what we're going to do before we push it to alpha, beta, and production. And that's important to us because we have a lot of stuff, which I'll talk about next. We built everything in one uh, It's 10 gigabytes, and that's actually small. I've gotten it down. Um, it, it's uh, the only way I can get these guys to use the system because then they don't need to know. When I type Python 2 warp, it always works. I t and warp is a code out of LBL. Um, uh, Shadow 3 is Python 3 now. Uh, it's a Fortran code that's wrapped in Python 3, but it's still Python 3. Uh, we have machine learning built into it, and I want to mention uh, we do visualization, and you know, it's PyDICOM. I'm really happy about this, and this is part of what I'm talking about is we never know what we're going to run into. So on Monday, we got a grant from NIH to do prostate cancer reading of prostate cancer MRIs and CAT scans uh, with machine learning. So we're going to be combining those two in our grant. And that wasn't a plan. We had separate things going on. And medical physics is a pretty broad thing. The whole environment is integrated into a single client that makes it very easy for us to um, run commands. So the users don't need to know anything. Um, we support Docker and VirtualBox Vagrant builds from the same scripts. Uh, we have a curl installer that lets people download it on their desktop. So they can uh, literally say curl jupyter.run pipe to bash. Um, uh, I know I grabbed that name and I probably will give it to you guys if you want it, but uh, it was one name that was nice to use. Jupyter Labs are called GUI. It's been that way for, I want to say six months. I don't actually know. Um, it's been great for everybody. Everybody's happy. Uh, one thing I did notice is you can't download a folder. You have to go back to tree mode in order to download a folder with NBZip. So it'd be cool if it was a download folder thing in JupyterLab. Just the site thing. We get upper authentication. Again, no POSIX users. So MPI is important to us. All these codes are written uh, with MPI at the core. Some of them are open MP, but most of them are MPI. Uh, inside uh, the containers, they mount it to the Jupyter directory, which is the same directory in their Jupyter container, but it's not running Jupyter in the, in the MPI containers. Um, our environment's different. A lot of our users run jobs for weeks, months, uh, sometimes these long, algorithm searches and they like it it's easier for them and so uh, we allocate nodes one or two to people it's a manual process we change a configuration file and run a configuration you know, manager tool inside the containers we're running sshd we give them the tls configuration we use docker host networking so that um mpi works i don't Heard mixed things about running MPI under Kubernetes, but I never was able to get it to work well. So um, somebody can help inform me if I can use zero to Jupyter up to get rid of all this stuff. Um, the wrapper makes it very easy. They don't need to know about the host. They can say rsmpi h one two, and that uses host one and two, or they can just say rsmpi, and it runs the whole thing on all the nodes that are allocated to them. We subclass Docker Spawner. Um, so we can manage our server pools, the configurations on the right side of this. Uh, explain, see, this is our uh, development configuration. Uh, since we're running a public server, we need to do garbage collection. Uh, we need to be able to kick people off so other people get the resource. Um, even internally, we're doing that because we're kind of allocating whole nodes. And the nice thing about this configuration is we decided, look, guys, I don't want to allocate whole nodes to you. We're going to give you partial nodes. One of the things we added was CPU limits. Um, so you can use uh, our scheduler or CFS configuration to, on Docker to set up a CPU limit on the Jupyter server. 
Uh, static pork range is important to us because we're running on a VLAN and we want to restrict what posts talk to what, um, especially with MPI. And um, I don't know what other people have, but when you have users that are not POSIX users, they're just from GitHub, they have some random name like Rob Nagler, you need to give them a directory and then that directory has to exist on an NFS in our environment. To make the directory. I don't know. I had a little adapter in there. I didn't see how to use that out of the box. Uh, another thing we do, if you know how Docker TLS works, it has this uh, certificate system for client server. We use a multi certificate authority approach so that uh, any user can go and get access only to the nodes. It, anyway, I'll, if anybody wants to know about that, it, it's important for security. And we dump the state every now and then so we can see what's going on. Um, so from user customization of slash radius, you, you want to know about how you can mount user views. The home directory is of the Jupyter server is in the image. Uh, tilde Jupyter is the NFS mount. When you start a Jupyter server, you may have wanted to install stuff or set your LD library path. With our, a lot of our codes, they really are finicky in the environment, right? So it's hard. So we uh, read a repo dynamically um, that can be used for patching things between releases or copying some template notebooks or whatever. Uh, we set up the git username in the command line git configurations, just a convenient thing. And if somebody has, uh, if, they're, if they have a GitHub name and if they have GitHub, their name, jupyter.raysoft.org, we'll run that repo before the Jupyter server starts. Uh, there's a bash RC file that we run that's in the NFS directory, and there's a bin directory that allows them to persist commands that gets in their path automatically. Uh, sharing is important to us. We're a small company. We have a few nodes, um, and uh, users will use it, everything up. So tilde Jupyter is uh, the NFS directory. It's shared with the MPI nodes. Sometimes we create a, have a workshop, we'll mount a, uh, another bind mount into the container, did that for the ICFA workshop, it worked really well. The teachers can then write the directories and the students can read from them, way to distribute notebooks uh, conveniently. For people who don't know Jupyter, that's the other thing, right? You know, if you start saying, well, go to Jupyter Lab, whatever, do all these fun things, people don't know that, they just know command line in general or looking in a file browser and saying, I click. Um, Generally, our users share with GitHub and email, which is unfortunate and reality. The CPU and memory limits allow us to share, have a shared host, and it's really important because we have users who get confused. In fact, I had a user complain, I thought I got three cores, and I went and I looked, I go, you did, but you had three or four MPI processes that were runaway, which happens with MPI in these codes, that was soaking up some of the cores. Um, Sometimes we start up a single notebook server uh, on a public node and we hand out the URL to a bunch of people. We were using a code called Flash, uh, which is out of uh, University of Chicago, and it's a funny code and it's used for nuclear stuff and in a way that people could use it without being in a public container. So, yeah, yeah, sharing a workspace. So they were actually logging into the same notebook server with two workspaces with Jupyter Lab. I, th I think it's a Jupyter Lab feature here. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, it is because I was doing it. But they're not running the same notebook. Uh, maybe, yeah, I, that's a good question. What I, I don't know, they were certainly running the same notebook, but I don't know simultaneously. We certainly don't. That's one of my wish list items is to have an interactive shared notebook, which they, so they may be running, to, uh, I don't know what happened actually in that case, so that's an unknown. My big wish list from a sysadmin point of view is being able to have storage limits. Docker allows you to have bandwidth limits, but doesn't allow you to have storage limits. Since we don't have POSIX users, we can't map that to quotas. And then I don't know how to do this, and maybe someone can tell me. Um, uh, user and group file sharing in a dynamic way would be awesome. So you could just say, here's a area for sharing, and this is what we're doing. It's got this much space, or whatever. Um, Real-time collaboration, like in CodeCalc, would be great. Um, 
Obviously, they have a completely different user interface. We switch to CoCal, but kind of invested. Um, better user notifications. If your server is going down, you want to notify the users. I'd like, um, you know, when we run out of servers, right now we return to 429, and it kind of looks okay, and people get confused because there isn't a refresh and everything. It's, it's funny. And so we have to have a little warning. If you see 429, this means that. Um, and finally, it'd be nice to have the Hub Admin page would be more like JupyterLab had the plugin, right? So it could provide information about which node someone's running on or how much CPU they're using, whatever the spawner can, you know, can re report. So users love, uh, users love Jupyter <laughs> and Jupyter love users. Uh, we uh, make it easy for them because everything's pre-installed. And they love that, I have to say. Um, and to all available resources, so the CPU limits was really key for us to be able to run a public server, especially with these scientific codes, because they, they just soak up CPU right, really fast. Um, and uh, I want to thank the Jupyter team, Fernando, everybody else out here, Jason, for doing a great job of providing an easily customizable environment. I can go in and subclass something, happen, I get responses from men all the time. It's, it's really easy to do this, and I don't do this as my full-time job. I do a lot of things as my full-time job, and so I have to be able to dive in really quickly to do something, and you know, it's even throwing it in the, uh, the configuration file, I'll do a subclass in the config configuration file for Jupyter Hub to get it to work, and say, so, oh yeah, maybe I should make a real subclass and put it in the repo. Anyway. Uh, thank you very much. You can get the slides at rsl.link slash jcw19. I'll be happy to answer any questions.